Hi, my name is Mary Nardi. I'm an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida for the last 30 years. In January of 2019, I was appointed as general magistrate in Seminole County in the Domestic Relations Division, where I primarily preside over divorce and paternity actions. Prior to my appointment, I was in private practice where I practiced exclusively in the area of family law for approximately 27 years. My portion of the presentation is essentially to give you a view from the bench as it relates to guardian ad litems. During my years of private practice, I had the opportunity to be appointed as a guardian ad litem in private divorce and paternity cases on numerous occasions. Acting as a guardian ad litem and advocating for a child's best interests was some of my most rewarding experiences as an attorney. As a general magistrate assigned to the Domestic Relations Division, I know firsthand how important and valuable a guardian ad litem's input and opinions are to the judge tasked with the enormous responsibility of rendering a decision based upon the best interests of children. As a judge or magistrate presiding over contested issues involving a child or children, it's very often difficult to ascertain where the truth, or should I say, reality lies. Without the input of a neutral third party, such as a guardian ad litem, the court is left without, with testimony of each parent in a he said, she said scenario. The important role of the guardian ad litem is to gather facts and just as important impressions based upon your factual interviews and review of relevant documents. Although a guardian ad litem may be somewhat restricted in reporting exactly what a child may report to a guardian ad litem, a well-crafted report and prepared testimony can provide the court with invaluable information Verifying factual information is crucial. However, an effective guardian ad litem will not only provide factual information, but explain how that information is relevant based upon the factors as set forth in Florida Statute 6113. And those impressions and conclusions you reach can also be based upon what a child may have reported to you. It's okay to tell the court that you were provided information from a child which helped you formulate your impressions and recommendations without the necessity of reporting exactly what that child said. As a guardian ad litem, it's very easy to get caught up with collateral information provided to you from each parent as well as their witnesses. It's extremely important to know where to put your focus and attention and not spend a lot of time reporting information that's not specifically relevant to the best interests of the children and the 60, 30, 6113 factors. And it's okay to ask the parties, what is the relevance of that information as it relates to the factors? The judge is gonna hear a lot of collateral information from each parent who will wanna present that information at trial. And often that information may or may not be helpful to the court in rendering a decision. It will be extremely valuable for the guardian ad litem to sift out that information the court is gonna to want to hear and not get caught up with unnecessary facts and very often emotional drama that the parents will want you to report. So in conclusion, be thorough, keep copious notes and records, and sort through the relevant from the unnecessary information based on the 6113 factors, and that way your impressions, conclusions, and recommendations to the court will be extremely helpful and persuasive to the judge or the magistrate. Hi, my name's Leah Duell, and I'm the Guardian at Leiden Program Director for the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association. If you've not heard of the Orange County Bar Association, the Legal Aid Society was established approximately 50 years ago by attorneys. And the Guardian at Litem program is administered by the Legal Aid Society. As part of our duties, we recruit volunteers to be pro bono GALs for the children of Orange County. The training topic today is GAL attorneys in domestic relations court. And you will hear about GLs and domestic relations from two speakers that will follow me today. I have been asked to provide a brief overview of the GL role in dependency court first. So part one of the training will follow this segment and we hope that you find this training to be informative. Thank you. Decades ago when the federal government decided to provide advocates for children in abuse and neglect proceedings, it endorsed a model where citizens would bring a common sense perspective to court proceedings and children would not be treated as just another case. Judges needed people to inform them and give them a view of the case from the child's perspective and be independent of the rest of the parties in the case. In many cases, the judges referred to this as having the need to have eyes and ears 
on the child and provide a child perspective in the case. Children needed advocates who would prioritize their safety, their well-being, and people who would put the child's best interests first. And this was the start of the Guardian at Leiden program. Initially in Florida, many of the Guardian at Leiden programs reported to the judges, and the judges would say, they're my eyes and ears, and I want to hear from the Guardian at Leiden to know what's going on with the child. This continued for many years, and during that time, the Orange County Legal Aid Society created the Guardian at Leiden program for Orange County, where pro bono attorneys would volunteer to be the Guardian at Leiden's. Elsewhere in the state, there were consistent support from citizens, the judiciary, governor, state, and local representatives, and also charitable organizations who also wanted to support Guardian at Leiden programs. So throughout the state, many independent Guardian at Leiden programs were created, and eventually there became a statewide Guardian at Leiden program. The statewide model is based on volunteers, and there are over 10,000 volunteers today that support and volunteer with the statewide Guardian at Leiden program. There are also statewide employees, usually a program attorney and a child advocate manager who work as a team with the volunteer. And they provide a perspective for the GAL in court and represent the child's best interest. In Orange County, that continues to be the pro bono attorney or a GAL staff attorney if there's no GAL pro bono on the case. We will look at the differences in the two forms of representation, both the Guardian at Leiden program statewide with the volunteer team model and also the GAL pro bono attorney model that is used in Orange County. So we will be looking at their court representation to address appointment orders, access to court records and other records necessary to review the child's case the role of the GAL in the courtroom, and also court filings. The first step for the guardian at Leiden in a dependency case is to have an appointment order. Typically, this happens at the shelter hearing when the case originates. In many cases, DCF might file a non-shelter petition and if that is the case, you would be appointed at the arraignment, which follows the non-shelter petition being filed. The GAL is appointed by the court to represent the child's best interest and ensure that the child's needs and wishes are addressed by the court. The statutory language is found in Florida Statute 39.822, and it indicates that the GAL may be appointed at shelter hearing or any time after. The GAL is a party to the dependency case, and this court order that appoints you gives you that authority. So you have access to the child's records. You can continue to represent the child's best interest from that day of appointment. And typically we have acceptance of the GAL appointment by individuals. So for example, in Orange County, we look for a volunteer pro bono attorney to accept the case. And that attorney would file a notice of acceptance with the court, alerting the court and the parties that they will be representing the child. And in addition to that, with the other model of representation with the statewide GL program, the statewide GL program offices would look for a volunteer once they are appointed. So they would find a volunteer willing to accept the case and they would in turn file a letter of acceptance for that volunteer, indicating that that volunteer will be the person representing the child's best interest to the court. Oftentimes, there may not be a volunteer either a pro bono attorney or a civilian volunteer to accept the case. So the Guardian at Leiden program can continue on the case as they have been appointed to represent the child's best interest and may continue to represent the child. The one time where it's most critical to have a GAL appointed on the case is for termination of parental rights. So oftentimes the GAL may ask for discharge if there is no available guardian at litem to accept the case. However, if the case is going towards termination of parental rights, the guardian at litem program would then reinitiate their search for a volunteer to accept the case and file an acceptance so that that volunteer would be able to prepare a manifest best interest report for the termination of parental rights trial.
The appointment orders also give you access to the child and it's important that you visit the child and be able to learn about the child's needs and wishes. And it's important to recall that the guardian ad litem is not appointed to represent the child's wishes or desires. Oftentimes there's some confusion about attorney ad litems versus guardian ad litems. And one of the best ways to distinguish between the two is that the guardian ad litem is appointed to represent the best interest of the child, whereas the attorney ad litem is appointed to represent the child's wishes. This is especially important for many of our children who have the um, inability to speak, the inability to express their wishes. Um, an example might be an infant child or a young child um, who has not learned to speak. They're unable to vocalize their wishes. And so the best interest attorney, the GAL, is able to observe that child, review their records, speak to other people involved in the child's life, and make a recommendation to the court based on that child's best interest. The same applies for older children, for example, teenagers who might have some mental health issues. They might be on psychotropic medication, they might be receiving counseling, but they're so mentally ill and not receiving the appropriate care without residential treatment. So there's a recommendation a medical professional has made for residential treatment and the child does not wish to go to the residential treatment facility. They would prefer to stay where they are, to stay in the school that they're attending, and stay with their friends or family. So the guardian at litem would look at all the factors in the case and make a recommendation based on what's in that child's best interest, not what the child wants. If that child has an attorney at litem, the attorney at litem is going to go to court and say, my client, the 14-year-old, wishes to remain in the current placement and not be placed in the residential treatment facility. Whereas the guardian ad litem, on the other hand, would advocate for what's in that child's best interest to get him or her the medical care and mental health treatment that they need and to hopefully rehabilitate them to the extent that they could re return to their normal lives. Access to records is very important for the guardian ad litem's role. The guardian ad litem has the right to inspect and copy records related to the best interest of the child who is subject, the subject of the guardian ad litem appointment. The GAL is an information gatherer, reporter, and reviewer of information. You might want to gather information from the caregiver of the child, the case manager, teachers, daycare providers, doctors, therapists, or anyone else with knowledge of the child. So it's very important to gather this information and be able to use it in your evaluation of the child's needs and include it in the reports that you would file with the court, whether they be oral or written reports. The GL reports to the court and may discuss the case with other parties as appropriate, but keeps this information confidential. So it's important here to know that you should always review the information that's available on the case. To make certain that you're receiving accurate information, it's often good to compare information that you receive from various sources. The most common records that we tend to get are school records or educational records for children that are school age. It's important to know how they're doing in school what their educational needs are, do they need assistance at school, do they have an individual education plan, an IEP, or other types of assistance being provided to them in the school, are they in need of those services. Um, you would certainly want to attend any type of educational meetings that are being held, such as an IEP meeting, and if you want to request records in advance of that meeting, school meeting, you would do so with a copy of your appointment order and your letter of acceptance. So it's always important to make sure that you have a current order of appointment, that it has not expired, that you don't need to file a motion to extend it. And so when you go to request those records from the school or elsewhere, that you do have that current order to provide. Medical records are really important for children that have special needs. Many of our kids are medically needy. And um, medical records can be quite convoluted, and it's oftentimes difficult to obtain them. 
You always want to start with the Department of Children and Families checking in with the CLS attorney to see if they have those records already. So you can request them through the, through the discovery process if necessary. And if you're unable to get them from DCF, then you can certainly subpoena them yourself or try to obtain the records. I will caution you they can be very voluminous and it's sometimes very costly to gather those records on your own. So you want to go through DCF if possible to get those records. Some of the other records that you might want to review for a child would be things such as the Comprehensive Behavioral Health Assessment, the CBHA, which contains the child's family medical history, um, general history of the family, whether or not the parents were married, how many siblings they have, any um, mental health history with the parents, any health assessments that were made previously on the child prior to coming into care. It sometimes details whether or not the children have educational issues and might even tell you if there's an IEP or a learning disability. And then the CBHA also makes a recommendation as to what the service needs are for that child. So does the child need counseling? Does the child need tutoring? Does the child need speech therapy? And these are all things that you would want to follow up on as the GAL later on if they've not been implemented and taken care of by the case management team. It's also a great place to check in if you have the opportunity and um, find out from the CBHA assessor, who's normally a, a mental health, a licensed mental health counselor, um, that they might have some information for you that they didn't put in their report. So you can sometimes call them up and get some great tips on things they may have found out that are not in the report. The GEL is a party to every case where they are appointed and the guardian ad litem has the ability to appear before the court, motion the court, and file pleadings. This is why for the statewide GEL program, there is the importance of having a program attorney assigned to every case. For Orange County, the guardian ad litem pro bono attorney can appear directly, but for the other volunteers with statewide program, they have to have the program attorney with them in court. The guardian ad litem is a fiduciary and has a responsibility for representing the child's best interest to hold all matters confidential and diligently pursue the best interest of the child. By statute, the guardian ad litem is responsible for representing the child and advocating for the child's best interests. This includes legal interests and advocacy outside the courtroom where decisions are made impacting the best interest of the child. The GEL is a fiduciary representative of each child and the representation of the child's best interest is the sole purpose of the advocacy. The GEL shall be present at all critical stages of the dependency proceeding and shall provide reports and recommendations to the court as required by law and in the child's best interest and take any other actions determined to be in the child's best interest. Using information gathered from the child the relevant records, interviews with people in the child's life, the GAL team or the GAL individual should identify the unique needs of the child and provide that independent advocacy to meet those needs consistent, consistent with the goals established by the legislature for children in dependency proceedings. Some examples are that they have to advocate for permanency for children. Reunification is always the primary goal and that should take place within one year. If the reunification has not taken place in one year, the guardian ad litem should be advocating for another more appropriate goal to accomplish permanency for the child. I wanted to speak a little bit about providing reports and recommendations at this point. The guardian ad litem in Orange County is exempt from filing reports other than manifest best interests in TPR cases. But in other counties, where the statewide GAL program is present, they file reports for many reasons. They file status reports, they file reports for judicial review hearings, and also file the TPR or manifest best interest reports. So it's important to remember that some of our roles differ a little bit, but our overall goal is just to advocate for the child's best interest at all times. And it's important to recognize that history of the GAL program here in Florida 
that the judges see us as the eyes and ears of the court. So these reports are very valued by the court and they want to have your position and your recommendations for the child's well-being. The role of the guardian ad litem is critically important to our dependency cases. The courts rely on our written and our oral reports, and the court will always want to hear from you about the child's wishes, the child's well-being, and whether it's on the docket or not, you should feel free to bring up these issues. So even if you're there for an arraignment, a parent's attorney may say, well, we're not here to, today to hear about the child's wishes, the court may wish to hear those wishes. So always advocate for your children at every available opportunity. And remember that the guardian ad litem is presumed to have a prima facie case to be acting in good faith, and in doing so shall be immune from any liability, civil or criminal, that otherwise might be incurred or imposed. And that's Florida Statute 39.822 sub 1. So remember that we need to convey to the court what's going on with the child and advocate for that youth who may need a guardian advocate or a guardianship later on in life. You wanna advocate for whatever is in the child's best interest. And it's also important that you be cognizant of the child's ability to communicate with you. Communication with children should be consistent, developmentally appropriate and culturally sensitive because we have children that come from all walks of life um, as the slide indicates, we're all wonderfully made, but we're all wonderfully different. And so it's important to convey to the court what those issues are sometimes. So if you have a problem or a concern with the case, you want to communicate with the child, you want to communicate with the court, and you also want to communicate with the other parties about what the child's needs are. The guardian ad litem's role is always evolving, and today we are evolving to attend other court hearings that impact our children. We're switching gears to talk about the role at this time of the GAL in other courts. So we interact with legal professionals on our dependency cases and also with professionals in other areas as well. So we are going to talk about delinquency, criminal, probate, and domestic relations. Delinquency cases stem from child involvement in activities for which they can be criminally charged, and they lead to involvement with the juvenile justice system and are sometimes referred to as kiddie court or juvenile court. If a child is involved in a juvenile justice case, they will typically be appointed a public defender or their parents, if they have the ability, can hire a private attorney. The child's parent and the public defender will determine the appropriate action for the child to take with regard to the case. They sometimes meet with the state attorney to see what's in the child's best interest and whether or not the child should take a plea or go to trial or possibly if the child can be offered a diversion of some sort. Oftentimes, the case manager will transport a child who has dependency court involvement to their dependency, excuse me, to their delinquency court hearings because there's no parent available. And so when that happens, there's oftentimes a case manager transporting the child that doesn't know the child, doesn't know about the child's needs. And it's very important for a GAL to be there if your child is the one in delinquency court. Uh, an example would be, um, for example, we have a, a young 14-year-old male who is sanctioned as part of his um, sentence in juvenile justice um, to write essays and perform community service. And he's in foster care and he has a learning disability. And the case manager who is acting on behalf of the parent 
doesn't know to tell the public defender that he doesn't believe the child can write an essay or he doesn't think the child can do community service because of where he's placed. And um, if the guardian at litem was at that hearing, the guardian at litem could talk to the state attorney, talk to the public defender, and inform them that this is a, a young teen who does not have the ability to write an essay, who doesn't have the ability to perform community service. So those sanctions would not be imposed and the child would not later be facing a possible probation violation. There is always the case where the guardian at litem may not even know about the delinquency case, but that's why it's important for guardian at litems to stay in touch with the child's case manager because the case manager will be informed when there are delinquency actions and they're usually the ones to bring them to the courtroom. So if you have a good relationship with that case manager, you will usually know about the delinquency cases and you will also be informed of when the hearings are. You will also sometimes be informed of staffings that take place prior to the child going to court. And you might be able to find out the name and phone number of the public defender that will be representing the child. So it's important to be strategic, to try to keep open lines of communication and to engage with the people that are in dependency court as well as delinquency court for the best interest of the child you're representing. Some strategies to address children's behaviors are to get them into counseling to address whatever may have led to the action that involved delinquency. And if you can get services for the child, such as evaluations, child studies, counseling to be completed, then you can in turn share that information with the members of the delinquency court, the state attorney, the public defender, whoever's representing the child in that courtroom and advocate for the child's best interest to have an appropriate sanction and to address their case in an appropriate manner. Many times we're fortunate today that we have unified family court, UFC court it's often called, or crossover court, where we have delinquency judges that also serve as dependency judges. So they usually have the children in both courtrooms. So they may already know the child and they will know you as the GAL and allow you to participate in the hearing, even though you may not be a party to that case. But you can advocate for the child's needs and best interest in the courtroom. Um, the court is typically willing to hear from a guardian at litem who accompanies the child to court. And I have done so many times and never been denied the ability to engage in the court hearing and advocate for the child's needs. So I urge you to attend those hearings and advocate for the children in delinquency court whenever you have the ability. Criminal court in this context is not referen referencing criminal activity by the child, but it's where the child is the victim of the crime. Criminal court ju judges are frequently finding the need to find representation for child crime victims. Many of the cases where children are victims, um, the children have no parent who considers their best interest and hence the need for a guardian ad litem. So oftentimes if there's a concurrent dependency case, the guardian ad litem that's been appointed for the dependency case might accept to be the guardian ad litem for the criminal court as well, or they might just be willing to go and visit the criminal court with the child and become aware of the issues in that case. In some ways, it's sort of like having joint representation for the two different cases. Um, oftentimes, we have um, criminal cases where a guardian ad litem has been appointed by the court in the criminal case, and then there will become a dependency case, and we do not have a guardian ad litem on the dependency case. So we might go to that attorney who is already representing the child as the guardian ad litem in the criminal court and ask them to accept appointment in our dependency case. And the reverse can be true as well. An example of such a case would be where a child was sexually abused and the perpetrator is the mother's boyfriend or husband, and the mother is more protective of her partner than her child that's been abused. So since the parent is not supportive of the child, is not willing to, you know, 
acknowledge that the child is a victim, then a guardian ad litem is necessary to represent that child's best interest. So the guardian ad litem in criminal court would accompany the child to any pretrial activities. This might include a deposition of the child. And so the guardian ad litem would be there to protect, to protect the child, ensure that the child is not taken advantage of in any way, and that there were no unnecessary depositions. And with regard to advocating for emotional support for the child, the guardian ad litem might be able to communicate directly with the state attorney to ensure that there's a victim's advocate available, that the child receives counseling, that the child's deposition or questioning even for trial is handled in such a manner as to protect the child and provide the child with emotional support. So that might mean um, having in-camera testimony for the child so that the child does not have to face the parent when they're testifying. It could also be that the child is um, allowed to have the deposition with only the parent's attorney in the room and not the parent. Um, the GAL is oftentimes called upon to just be that steadfast person there for the child to support the child. We also sometimes see that guardian ad litems in criminal court become involved with the state attorney with negotiating the perpetrator's sentence. Um, an example of this would be a case we recently had in Orange County where the guardian ad litem was able to help negotiate the sentence and negotiated that you know there be no contact with the child victim, that the perpetrator assist with counseling for the child, in other words, pay for the counseling that the child needed and um, obtain therapy for the child. So the guardian can advocate for these services in criminal court through the state attorney as part of a negotiation or even by filing certain motions in criminal court. And of course, the uh, GAL would have had to have filed an acceptance in that court prior to filing any motions. So I would encourage you to, um, if, you, if the child that you are the GAL for in dependency court has a case where they are the victim, that you become cognizant of the facts of that case. They sometimes tie into the dependency case anyway and reach out to the state attorney involved and do what you can to make certain that the child's best interest is represented in both courtrooms. Typically, children involved in probate court have deceased parents or caregivers. The child would need a guardian to assist with advocating for their best interests. Oftentimes, it may be an attorney at litem, or if there's already a guardian at litem who may serve for probate as well. Children in probate court sometimes need guardian advocates, and they may have special needs or be aging out of the dependency system. Depending on the child's needs, the guardian advocate may assist in determining their ability to manage their funds, to marry, to vote, etc. The role of the guardian advocate can be plenary, covering a multitude of issues, and it sometimes has very limited scope as well. It might just be re receiving a social security disability check as the payee and making certain that the child has the money and funds necessary to meet their needs each month. If a guardian advocate is needed, the guardian at litem, already appointed in the dependency case, may be involved. And that's usually from the standpoint that you'll have a staffing as the child's about to turn 18, determine whether or not the child is going to require that guardian advocate. And if the court determines that a guardian advocate is needed, the GAL would be involved in the process of, of identifying and recommending the person to serve as a guardian or guardian advocate for the youth. And it's always interesting in these cases because it's sometimes difficult to find volunteers to, to become the guardian advocate. So there is sometimes a list that is used in various counties and circuits, and other times you as the attorney may actually need to go to some of your friends in, that are in the bar, um, fellow members of the bar who may be interested in volunteering in this capacity and asking them to become a guardian advocate. Most times we have certain attorneys that are our go-to attorneys that you would go to and say, hey, I've got another case where we may need a guardian advocate. And even if they're unwilling to take the case, they might have someone else that they know of that works in the probate area and they could take that role on. 
Um, but as the guardian at litem, if you have a child involved in that process, you do want to attend the hearings to be aware of what's going on and also just to be there to explain what's going on to the child. Um, one of our roles as a guardian advocate is to help communicate with the child. If you've already been on the case for a year or more and you know that child and have a rapport with the child, it's very beneficial to, for the, you to attend those hearings. And whether the child's there or not, you can explain to them at a later time, if they're not present, what has occurred and why it's occurring. Furthermore, you might be able to assist the probate court if you're aware of any evaluations or child studies that were done previously. And those records may need to be shared with the court and probate to help determine whether or not the child actually does need a guardian advocate. Again, the overall role of the guardian at litem is to represent the child's best interest, to advocate for the child's best interest, and whatever court you're in, you can do that to the best of your abilities and be fulfilling your role as the guardian at litem. Domestic relations is the last topic that I'm going to review. And um, domestic relations can cover placement of the child, visitation with parents or other parties, emotional support of the child, and other issues. Visitation or time sharing, as it's commonly known now, is usually determined based on the parent's filings in domestic relations and children's wishes are not usually included. However, the court sometimes feel it necessary to appoint a guardian at litem who will meet with the child and have input on arrangements requested by the parents. Additionally, the guardian at litem may need to recommend therapeutic visitation or other counseling services if that would be in the best interest of the child. Occasionally, the dependency guardian at litem is already on a case and following the conclusion of the GL's duties in dependency court, there may be domestic relations hearings. And so the guardian at litem might be called on to continue in the guardian at litem capacity in the domestic relations case. Now you're gonna hear from two additional speakers following my presentation that will go into much more detail about domestic relations. So I'm gonna leave it there Next, we're going to address a couple of questions that have been posed. The first question was, how long have you worked as a dependency attorney? And let me figure this out. I think it's about 16 years now. Um, I started out working for the statewide um, GL program in Seminole County as a senior attorney in 2012 and worked there until 2018. I'm currently in my second year with the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association. And so prior to that, um, and prior to becoming a GAL attorney, I worked for the Department of Children and Families as an assistant regional counsel. And then later when they changed their model of representation and created the Children's Legal Services Law Firm, um, I um, continued with them as a senior attorney. Um, there's even a plaque in the Daytona Beach um, office of Department of Children and Family. CLS's Daytona office has a plaque in their library with all the founding members of their law firm. And my name is on that plaque. And I worked for DCF in Volusia County for approximately eight years. So I learned a lot as um, a DCF attorney and very much enjoyed working for them. Um, but I really find that the GAL work is really in my heart and what I love doing. Is there another question? Okay, our next question is, have you practiced in other courts where dependency GALs have a role? Yes, prior to starting to work for um, DCF in Volusia County, I was a public defender in Volusia County and represent defendants who had criminal charges involving neglect and abuse of children. I also did other types of criminal representation as well for the public defender's office, but 
I ended up having quite a few cases involving child neglect and abuse. Um, during this time, I got to know a lot of the DCF investigators that worked in the DeLand area where I worked and um, got to know a lot about DCF through deposing some of those DCF investigators. And I was also subpoenaing a lot of DCF records. So I learned an awful lot about the Department of Children and Families from my work as a public defender. Um, I also learned about case plans at that time and services that were available for parents. So one of my go-to um, plea negotiations for those types of cases was to ask that the parents have a probationary sentence and have a requirement to complete their case plan task. And so generally those case plan tasks would resolve what the issues were that led to the criminal incident as well. And so that was a good way to resolve the cases and made sure that my clients got the services they needed and were able to get their kids back as well. I also practiced in the Unified Family Court in Volusia County as a DCF attorney. The Unified Family Court in Volusia County included delinquency cases, so the child cases, um, parents' divorce cases, and even child support cases. So as a DCF attorney, I would be present and have the opportunity to speak up and engage with the court and all parties on those cases. And I would oftentimes become involved in those other types of litigation. For example, if a father was paying child support to the mother and the mother was no longer the caregiver, I would advocate for redirection of the child support to the current caregiver. Very important as the DCF attorney, you wanted to make certain that your caregiver was able to care for the children and if the child was entitled to child support, you wanted that child to be receiving the child support. I would also um, advocate for child support to be ordered if there was none ordered. And I would quite often provide child support orders to the judges in Volusia County. And once the judge signed off on the order, I would then submit that order to the Department of Revenue, which would actually be the agency that would enforce the child support. Currently, I appear in delinquency court with a good bit of regularity. I'm the GAL for several teen youth who have delinquency cases, and so I make it a habit to attend their delinquency hearings. I also attend other matters regarding their delinquency hearings, and I frequently engage with their probation officers, um, their counselors, and sometimes when they're placed at DJJ facilities, I visit them at the DJJ facility and um, communicate with staff members at those facilities to make certain that the children's needs are being addressed in their placement. The next question we have is, how many children do you advocate for as a GAL? I am currently the GAL on three cases in Orange County and have seven children that I represent. Um, I've had as many as five personal cases that I've represented children on and represented their best interest. I normally accept cases with teenagers who have educational issues. As an aside, um, education is one of the issues that I focus on and specialize to some extent in. And I attend a lot of IEP meetings, individual education plan meetings, and um, love getting involved in making certain kids get all the services they need to improve their educational capabilities, whether that be tutoring, additional services in the classroom, such as having additional time for testing, and many other services that can be implemented on the school level. Um, right now, though, I have one case which has a, a baby on it, so I'm very much enjoying having a baby to deal with. Um, reviewing records such as the child's medical records, the child um, that I currently have that's an infant has a flat spot on the back of her head. So just recently I did a phone visit with that child. And so I had to ask the, um, the caregiver to turn her so, to the camera so that I could see the back of her head and see that the flat spot is getting better and her hair is actually starting to grow back, which I was very happy to see last week. Okay, our next question is, how do you support a child's request to participate in court hearings? Um, 
Children in dependency court have the right to participate in all aspects of their proceedings, from shelter to termination of parental rights. And various courts handle this differently. For example, when I worked in Volusia County as a DCF attorney, children were routinely brought to shelter hearings and judicial review hearings. They have the opportunity to speak to the judge at those hearings, and they were also given some expl explanations about what was going on. You know, if they wanted to go home with the parent, the judge would explain to them why that wasn't going to happen on that day and that the parents were working towards getting them back. And typically, um, the child would just say hello to the judge, um, maybe say that they wanted to go home or say that they did not want to go home. That happens too. And the child would be escorted out of the courtroom and there was a child's playroom that most of the children would go to and some of the older children would just be escorted outside the courtroom. And some of the teenagers were actually allowed to stay in the courtroom and hear what was going on if that's what they asked the judge to do. This also provided an opportunity for attorneys to speak to the children prior to the hearing. So as a GAL attorney, um, I think that would be really great because you would be able to see the child prior to each judicial review hearing and even the shelter hearings to talk to them. Now, when I practice um, here in Orange County, the children are not brought to the courthouse and the DCF attorneys generally ask for them to be excused in advance and they put that on all their orders that the children are excused and they usually don't ask the parties for a position. They just say the children are being excused for age or because they're in school or something to that effect. And the court grants the request for the child to be excused unless the GAL or someone else would speak up and say the child wanted to be in the hearing or that the child needed to be brought inside to speak to the judge or whatever the case may be. Um, the guardian at litem can request that the child be brought to court at any time. So if the child has conveyed to you a desire to attend court, then you certainly are going to convey that to the court and ask that the child be present in the courtroom. Um, I typically explain the court proceedings to the children and discuss with them whether or not they would like to attend court when I visit with them. And typically these are older children, so they have the ability to communicate with me and decide if they want to come. And if a child requests to attend court, I generally speak to the case manager and ask the case manager to transport the child, or in some cases I might transport the child myself. However, on occasion, the case management team does not bring the child as you would request. And this just recently happened in one of my cases. So at that hearing, I did object because the child was not present. The child had expressed her desire to be present at all future hearings. And I asked the court to order that the child be transported to the next hearing. And so um, I'll wait and see what happens later this month if the child is in fact transported. But I'm pretty certain that she will be since the court did order it. Um, our next question is, have you had help, had to help children prepare to testify? Um, so yes, I have helped children um, and prepared them for testimony in court. This is part of your role as a GAL. Um, you generally as the GAL know the child best out of everyone that deals with the child. And so you do want to make certain that the child is age appropriate to testify. Um, I recommend that you meet with the child if you have not already met with them to ascertain whether or not they have the developmental and emotional skills that they need to um, actually testify in court without harm to them. Oftentimes you want input from the child's counselor or therapist or others that are involved with the child about whether or not they think the child is appropriate to testify. And consideration should be given to the comfort of the child. I generally try to make arrangements for the child to meet me at the courthouse prior to the testimony so that I can prepare them from the standpoint you want them to be familiar with the courthouse, um, to understand where in the courtroom they will sit, who else will be in the courtroom, and explain to them generally what will happen in the hearing where they're going to be called upon to testify. I like, for example, if it's a trial and they're going to be in the, in the witness box, I want them to sit in that witness box prior to that hearing so they get comfortable with it. Um, there are other things you can do to make a child comfortable in the courtroom as well. 
Sometimes I um, ask to move a podium so that the podium might block somebody that the child doesn't want to look at when they're testifying. I also arrange for therapy dogs to be available to come to court with the child. And even when I meet with the child at the courthouse, I will request that the therapy dog be there to provide some comfort to the child. And if the child has a good rapport with that dog, I will then request the exact same dog be brought the day that the child will testify. But that's just one of the things that I like to do to prepare the child. You're also going to want to obviously go through what the anticipated questioning is going to be for the child. And I oftentimes invite the DCF attorneys to join me when I meet with the children so that they too can ask the children the questions and be, be you know, open with the DCF attorney as well as to what I will be asking the child. So sometimes that will allow the child to have fewer questions that they need to testify about. So that's my tip for how to handle preparing the child for testimony. And I think we are out of time, so that will be the end of the questions that I can answer today. But if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email me or call me, and my contact information is available on the documentation. Thank you. This concludes part one of the training. If you have any questions about the training, please contact me at the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association. The training on GAL attorneys in domestic relations court is next. I hope you enjoy it.